for today is, is Matthew 4, 12 through 22. 4, 12 through 22. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light at dawn. From the time on Jesus, from the time, from that time, on Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. On Monday this week, I did my best to not listen to any reports about the Super Bowl. <laughs> and I'll be honest, I'm not really that much of an Eagle fan. I'm a Steelers fan. Um, Steelers and Penn State, they were the people growing up that I just met. And I, finally, about 5 o'clock, I heard two comments that I really liked about the Super Bowl. One is, it's not very wise for people to live and die about what 11 people are doing on the field and they don't even know who you are. <laughs> so take it easy. But then another person just went rightfully said, football's in good hands. We've got a lot of great quarterbacks that have retired in the last couple of years. The new ones coming up are pretty awesome. And that's, uh, we can look forward to cheering and all those things. So as I was trying not to do some things, I said, well, like get yourself. I looked at my to-do list that I always have, and there's things that haven't gotten to that yet. I'll take care of that today. So I stopped by the Shrin Community Center of Palmer Township to request permission for our sunrise service and also reserve the park for the church picnic. When I walked up to the gal in the, uh, the, the, the desk there where you walk in, I told him why I was there. She said, were your ears burning? And I said, no, I said, we were just talking about a half hour ago about how we haven't had the request to do the sunrise service yet. And I said, that's pretty cool. They're thinking about us. This will be our 34th annual Easter sunrise service. It would have been 35th. It would have been 35th, but we had to skip that 2020 year. Remember that we didn't do that that year. Um, now, there's two ways to look at such longevity. One is we are faithful. And I like that thought. Another way is we're stuck in a rut. <laughs> Just keep doing the same old things. And I share that with you because we've been asking for prayer for the town hall meeting after this service and then the annual meeting after next Sunday's service. And I, I want to be, I keep, I feel like I'm apologizing all the time, but I, I'm a firm believer that there's time to think creatively and there's time to think critically. I find when I have to do something where I have to do a lot of critical thinking, I get very distracted by something I want to think about that I don't have any pressure on. And my, my daughter does this. She's, she's in the midst of helping a school uh, do the Wizard of Oz for their spring play. And she'll talk about all the things she's doing with us and then she'll say, and I'm thinking about this and this and this for next year. She's more excited about the next year than the stuff she, because right now it feels like work. If you think of the town hall and the annual meeting, think of it that way. Today's creative thinking. Ask the questions. We don't have to get anything past today. We're just trying to get as many questions answered before. That doesn't mean we won't answer questions the following week. But if we get more of them answered this week, we can get through the business of the following week a little bit easier. Because we don't meet in the evenings anymore and we're keeping you after church and you won't be eating and you might get hungry and we want to get that moving along as well as possible. 
But as much as we've been asking for prayer and the ballots, I sent them out. Those that are on the email list, you saw the ballot. They're also posted if you want to check and see who we'll be voting on for the, the officers and so forth. But as much as we've been asking prayer for the town hall and for the annual meeting, I want to ask you to, pr to pray for one more. I think it's Saturday, March 4th. The elders have set aside uh, Saturday morning to meet from, I think it's 8 or 9, 9 to 12, just to evaluate where we've been and to dream for the future, to, to the, consider the vision that God would lead us to in the future. Now, that's very important, and, and I'm, I'm excited about that. And I want to give you, if you have any ideas, talk to us before that meeting. And we're gonna put these, we're not gonna cover everything, but we're, it's a, a great way to start. Uh, after Christmas this year, I would evaluate, are we gonna do Christmas the same way next year? Or are we stuck in a rut? You know, we, what are we gonna do? So we're gonna kind of do that for as much of the, of, of, of the ministry as we can. So pray for us. That's the Saturday after the annual meeting. So we'll have everything kind of wrapped up and we will begin to really lay out. We've got ideas floating around. We just wanna get them on paper and make sure we're all on the same page. So I ask that you, you pray for that. Um, a lot has been happening in our church. A lot has happened. You heard Mar Marcos talk about just how difficult um, COVID-19 was to them, the forced changes on what they do and how they're trying to figure it out. That's kind of how we feel. So uh, as things continue to calm down for COVID at least, we want to really take the time and pray about such things. Well, last week we talked about Jesus' preparation for ministry. Let's see if I can make this work. Oh. Yes. Oh, this is a new thing. I'm not seeing it. I'm not trying to, am I, I'm not messing anything up up there, am I? Um, I was looking for my uh, pointer, but it's not that way. Um, it says it's on, but it's not. Anyway, um, we talked last week about Jesus' preparation for ministry. So I'm going to stand to the side and just point out there's numbers. Follow the numbers. There's a number one up there by Nazareth. And that's where Jesus was raised. He grew up there. And then last week we learned how he came down to number two down here, Bethany, across the Jordan. That's where he was baptized. And after that, he was driven into the desert, and he was tempted by Satan. He was there for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I'm going to talk more about that map as we go, but I'm saying that's where we were last week. Today is the beginning of his actual ministry. If last week was preparation, today we start to see some of the things that he is doing. And in that ministry, the proposition I want us to consider this morning is this. Following Jesus involves change and trials. Are you ready to sign up? People don't like change. People don't like trials. The reality is change and trials are coming anyway. I'd rather follow Jesus through them. I'd rather be walking with him as the things happen around us, as the, thing, as the difficulties we have to go through. So that's my proposition this morning. I'm going to pray. We're going to get right into Matthew 4, beginning at verse 12. I think it says 11 up there, but anyway, um, verse 12 of Matthew 4. And we're going to look at some things that happen. Just It's a short passage, but there's a lot of things when you look at a harmony of the Gospels that I'll, I'll kind of bring in as well. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Palmer Township that they're expecting us to set up for that service. And I pray that even though we've been doing it for so many years, that we do make changes. We've changed the way we do things there. And we have seen, I know at the, at the 30th one, I was ready to quit doing it. But that was the year we had five people come to the church for that, for that one. And it's just exciting to think about what you're going to do, when you're going to do it. We know that we're planting seeds, even if we don't see a direct harvest. And I pray that you would make us faithful for the ministries coming up. I thank you for the Bible study that started today, the different things that are going on. Lord, we pray that we would follow you and, and follow you in what you lead us to do. I pray, Lord, that you'll have mercy on me, a sinner, that nothing I am or say or am distracted by 
uh, just that your word would speak to us through the power of your spirit to it today. Bless us to know you better because of our time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So following Jesus involves change and trials. The first point we have is follow through life's changes. We need to follow Jesus through life's changes. The best way to handle change is to know that Jesus is leading you. Look at verse 12 of Matthew 4, if you have your Bibles open. It says, Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. There are two changes that I want to emphasize in this point. The first is people changes. Do you know the people have changed in your life? The people who had to be who were taken out of your life? We have grief share. Some people have lost people because of death. Other people have seen friends move away. Uh, other times you've moved away. There are always people changes in your life. And what I see here is John was arrested. He was the beginning of the ministry. Now he's thrown in prison. So what's Jesus going to do? He's going to start to call disciples. And before we see what we're going to read here in Matthew, John chapter 1 shows the beginning of Jesus calling disciples. Because Andrew, the brother of Peter, and John, the brother of James, were followers of John the Baptist. And after the baptism, John saw Jesus one day, and he pointed to his disciples and pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that was the beginning of Jesus starting to acquire followers. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But, but the, the, the idea is, it moved from John the Baptist to Andrew, who got Peter, to John, who got James, and a little bit later we hear about Philip, who called Nathaniel. That's six of the twelve right there. And it happened real early. Sometimes I think it all happened. No, this all happened somewhat early. Jesus starts to take these men. Now, he travels with them, and we'll talk about places in a second, but he travels with them, and when he came back to the Passover feast, they were with him, and I, I want to read to you, I think it should be on the screen, the next next one. Oh, yeah, John. This happens in John 2, 23 through 24. Let me read that to you. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Listen to this. Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. You hear what Jesus is saying? I'm not going to trust in any one person. I'm not going to count on any one person. I love fellowship. I love being with people. But people come and people go. John the Baptist was there. He's gone. These disciples will be there, but we've been, we were studying in, in the Gospel of John in our men's fellowship. When the, day, when the day came for him to go to the cross, they were gone. They left him alone. And to, to know you can't trust people. It doesn't mean you shouldn't relate with them, but don't put your hope in them. So when people changes occur, it shouldn't floor you. Now, we prayed for Kyle Robinson, that's my nephew, and the Ministry of Hand Evangelism. When I first went off to Handy Camp for the first time, my brother was the camp director at the time, and uh, I worked five summers with the disabled at that camp. The first two summers, my brother had a roommate. His name was Ralph, Uncle Ralph. Uncle Ralph was a great guy. He had a puppet. That puppet related to the mentally disabled so well. The kids loved Ralph. I loved Ralph. Sometimes even more than my brother, but don't tell me. <laughs> he was just a fun guy. My brother was the director. He, was the, the, he did the nuts and bolts to make sure everything was ready. But Ralph was out there having a ball with everything. Well, Ralph came to my brother one day and said, listen, the church that I grew up in just had a church split, and the Lord is calling me to go back to my hometown and minister to my family and to my church. It's, it's wonderful what I'm doing here. I enjoy it, but I think God's calling me someplace different. I said, what will Handy Camp be without Uncle Ralph? And new people came in, and God used them. Now, there's other examples just from our church. When I came to this church, heard all about the wonderful Awana program, 100 kids in a space that probably didn't accommodate 100 kids. And, and, and the, the people that were in charge, well, then they stepped aside. What are we going to do? Somebody else stepped in. 
step in. We had a, a long-term Sparky director that was here for years. You see the plaque down there, you can see her name many times because she was such a faithful worker. And she stopped serving. And, and what are we going to do? Whenever somebody steps aside for whatever reason, God has somebody else. I think about the music ministry of our church. We've had wonderful choir directors over the years. We've had wonderful praise team directors over the years. God knows who we need when we need them, and he brings them in. We do not have to panic when someone moves on for whatever reason. We pray for them and pray for those that will be coming in their stead. So I, I just want to share that thought. People changes are always going to occur. Don't let it stop you from following Jesus through those changes. But then the next thing would be places change. Places change. We need to recognize, or place changes. I don't know how to put it up there. Yeah, place changes. Have you ever had to fill out uh, to get a background check? They want to know where you've lived for a number of years. Have you ever reviewed that, all the places you've lived in your lifetime? To think about. I've worked at five different camps when I was in college. I've worked at three different churches full time, plus an internship. I went to two different colleges. I kept changing a lot. God moves us around. He hasn't, now I've been here for quite a while, but, but the fact is he moves us around and we should learn to follow Jesus through these place changes. Again, I wish this thing worked, but um, I want to go back to the map here for a second and just keep following the numbers. We left Jesus here in the desert on number three. Uh, we see number four, he went back to the Bethany of Jordan. That's where John the Baptist pointed and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's where he started to meet some of these people. Even though they were all Galileans, they met down here. And then on his way up, either on his way there or maybe even all the way up to Bethsaida. Bethsaida is where Peter grew up. But his mother-in-law was from Capernaum. I'll show you a picture here in a second about that. So they went up from there. But as he was acquiring these um, followers, he took them to Cana. You see number five up there? He took them to Cana where he did his first miracle. This is all from the Gospel of John. So he already had disciples following him at that point. At the end of that, he went up to Capernaum for just a time to rest, probably because Peter said, hey, my mother-in-law, she'll, she'll take care of us. So they went in and, and, and arrived there. And after a couple of days, it was time to go to Jerusalem, number seven, for the Passover feast. The verse that I just read, where he did not entrust himself to people, because he knew people. So Jerusalem, he said, Passover feast. It was there that he cleansed the temple for the first time. It was there that he met Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And then he started on his way into the Judean wilderness for a little bit. Um, it says that one of the things that happened for John the Baptist to go to prison is they realized more people were following Jesus because of the baptisms that Jesus was doing. But it wasn't Jesus, it was Jesus' followers. His disciples were doing baptisms. Now again, I, I get over, I get caught up in the weeds. If you ever get an opportunity to pick up a harmony of the Gospels and you really want to kind of get an overview of Jesus' life, this lays them side by side and you can follow through. And that's where I'm seeing all these things. Matthew has not joined the group yet. So he's only sharing what was shared with him. And he kind of leaves a lot out. And I'm trying to give you a little bit of how this is developed. Right now I'm talking about places. From Judea, John chapter 4, he went through Samaria, the woman at the well. Nine, that was 9. You go up to 10, there was a miracle that happened in Canaan, not the turning the water into wine, but actually a person from Capernaum heard that Jesus was there in Canaan, came to Canaan and said, could you heal, I think it's their child, could you hear my child, and said, you don't have to come. And Jesus said, you go your way, your child's here, healed. And when he got back home, he realized, yep, at the very time Jesus said he was healed, that's when the child got better. So again, these are just places, a change of places. So we're on number 10. Jesus, I don't know if he intended to settle into Nazareth, that was his hometown, but he went to Nazareth. And that's the last number that I have to point out. 
In Nazareth, if you remember the story, he presented himself in the synagogue, read a prophecy about the Messiah, and then looked at his hometown and said, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Could you imagine a little child growing up in our church and standing in the pulpit and said, I am God's gift to you. Um, well, we watched you grow up, sir. I'm not so sure that that's the case. And they were so angry with Jesus, they took him out and tried to push him over a cliff. And Jesus passed through them. And from that point, he went to Capernaum and set up his home base in Capernaum. His Galilean ministry would always go back to Capernaum. That's where he lived. And I have to show you this one picture of Capernaum. Uh, it was one of the top two favorite places I visited in Israel with Nancy. Um, that in Nazareth, they both, they both were it was just exciting to be there. That ancient building, they believe, was built in the fourth century on top of the synagogue that Jesus would have ministered in, in Capernaum. It's a real place. All these stories on the map, they're real. Jesus was a real person. Some people think, oh, it's just stories that teach us things. No. They were there. Now, that other building, uh, you've heard me say it before, whenever you go on a holy land, anything uh, special, they put a building on top of it. Mm -hmm. That building is over a place that they believe to be uh, Peter's mother-in-law's house. And it's a beautiful, and I'll show more pictures when we get to the story about that. But the beauty of that, if you continue down from the, the synagogue to the Peter's mother-in-law's house, the, the sea is just down there. They can get a picture of the sea right there close to the Sea of Galilee. I love Capernaum thinking about how Jesus spent most of his northern ministry, his Galilean ministry from there. He would go to other places, but that's where he set up shop because Nazareth had rejected him. Now, I maybe get caught in the weeds too much, but the thing I want you to see is that Jesus knows the people that are changing in your life. He knows the places that are changing in Continue to follow him. Continue to follow him. Now, going on to verses 14 through 16. So that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the land of Zebulon and the land of Nepali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. I want to say, in the midst of all the changes, the Word of God does not change. The Word of God does not change. Remember I told you there's about 23 prophecies that Matthew points out that were fulfilled in Jesus' ministry. Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. I'm not going to go back to the map. Well, there's a little one there, but I didn't put the south in there. We know that he was. Uh, his parents were from Nazareth, but Jesus was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. How do we get Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem? We have Caesar call for a census, and they had to travel. And that's why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We also know there's a prophecy about pulling his son out of Egypt. So how do we get Jesus to Egypt? We have a, a wicked king trying to kill him, and he has to flee to Egypt. And he's called out of Egypt. And then it says that when Joseph was allowed to come back in and King Herod was dead, he went to stay in Judea and said, now his son's still here. I'm going back north. He was going to head, he headed home because the prophecy said he will be called a Nazarene. So he was in Nazareth. He was in Nazareth. So today what we see here because of the rejection in Nazareth, he moved to Capernaum. And if I had superimposed uh, an Old Testament map on there, you would see it in the, in the, the tribes of Zebulon and Naphtali. That's right where they were. So they were, Jesus is fulfilling prophecy, everything he's doing. It's fulfilling a prophecy. And the reason I emphasize that is because in the midst of all the changes in life, I want to know what I can go to that I can count on. Do I go to the evening news? Do I listen to people that have let me down? Do I go to the Word of God. I go to the Word of God. It is the most accurate, Rep representation of and out of all ancient literature we have more documentations about the Bible than anything else that we don't question Shakespeare's writings that wasn't but the ancient writings in Greece we have a few pictures and we accept them 
The Bible has so many copies. Not the originals, but copies because it was so important. God's people have kept the Word of God because the Word of God does not change. That's one of the key ways to handle all the changes in life, wherever you are or whoever you're with. Then look at verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Have you heard that message before? Same thing John the Baptist said. And remember what repent means. Turn. Turn. What does it mean the kingdom of God is at hand? Jesus is there. Jesus is there. But, uh, John the Baptist is saying, it's coming. He's, it, it's close. Now it's here. Now, did the people understand that? No. They didn't understand that. But that was his message. The thing I would take from that verse is, we must turn to Jesus daily. Not just to his word, but know that through his word we are turning to him. He is the living word, we have the written word. And if I'm going to bolster myself up during all the changes that are forced upon me, whether people move on and I don't, they're no longer a part of my life, or whether God moves me from one place to the next, I know that I can follow God's word and his word will point me to Jesus. That's what I'm saying when I say follow Jesus through life's changes. Don't try to keep it from happening. You'll, you'll fight a losing battle. Now, in addition to the world changing around us, hopefully we are changing. Are you the same person you were 10 years ago? Hopefully not. Hopefully you're growing. So I want to talk a little bit about these disciples and just four steps of how some of them were brought to follow Jesus. I've already mentioned John 1, when John the Baptist pointed two people, Andrew and, and um, John, to Jesus. And, he, and when he was following, he turns around and said, what, did, what is it that you see? And he said, Master, where are you staying? So, Come see. And they spent the day with him. First step. Of personal change, someone's got to tell you about Jesus. Think about the first person that told you about Jesus. Hearing about Jesus is important. We learn in marketing. You don't get somebody to buy on the first step. You get your name out there and they learn about you and then they start to trust you and then maybe, so whether you're marketing a church or marketing a business, name recognition is important. Well, John the Baptist began the name re recognition for the disciples. And, and John the Baptist told Andrew, and John and Andrew told his brother Peter and John told his brother James and then later Jesus called Philip and Philip went and told um, told Nathaniel yes get the name right so we hear about Jesus but then it has to become personal we have to hear from Jesus we have to hear him call us we have to hear him call us I used to teach a, one of the classes in the membership class when we did it a little bit differently. And I, and I did it and I would talk about God's call. I'm here to tell you, each person in this room is called. Some are called to do different things. The different, when I studied about God's calling on my life to go into the ministry, the way I finally understood it was, we're all called to follow Jesus. Some are called to lay down their nets and make their living off of the gospel. That's the way really people will say it. Now, there are, there are plenty of good pastors planting churches that work in another job. More power to them. When I was younger, I might have been able to pull that off, but thankfully the Lord's always never, I've never had to do that. I've always been able to work full time in, in the work that he's called me to. But we're all called, and we need to hear his call. Now, the first call we hear is a call of salvation to recognize we need a savior. And then we hear a call to service and a call to holiness so that we can learn to walk with him. So first two steps, hearing about Jesus and then hearing Jesus call. And then there's another part of the story which I really believe is separate from what Matthew's referring to here. In Luke five, there's another call at the Sea of Galilee. I believe that the men followed Jesus for a little bit and they weren't completely organized yet. Um, and they went back to their fishing. They went back to fishing. And in Luke 5, we know that Jesus said, can I use your boat to teach? 
It wasn't the first time they met. They said yes, and they put out a little, when he was done teaching, he said, hey, why don't you go out and put out for a catch? And that great line by Peter, Lord, we fished all night, nothing happened, but if you say so, we will. And if you've seen this in The Chosen, uh, other people put other stories around, about, it's just amazing. They put out to, to the sea not too far, and the nets filled up so much they began to break, and the boat was going to sink. See, not only do we have to hear about Jesus, hear him call, we need to see Jesus' power. If we're going to grow in our relationship with the Lord, we need to see him at work. And when you start to see things that God does, it encourages you. Now, I'm going to recommend two books. Actually, my wife should be here to recommend it. Probably if she was here, I wouldn't talk about it, but I'm, she's not here, so I can't. When we were first married, she grew up in a home where dad never raised his voice. I grew up in a home of screamers, and she realized that I screamed. And the Lord led her to a book by Stormy O'Mardian called The Power of a Praying Wife. And Stormy O'Mardian was married to a great musician. They were musicians, and he had all kinds of issues, just like me. And Stormy learned to pray for her husband. And continue to pray for her husband. Now, didn't change overnight, but she learned the power to persevere with this guy that she had committed to marry. Recently, I've noticed my older daughter, she hears this, I'll get in trouble, but then, my older daughter is just a busy person. She's also an introvert. She lives alone, and sometimes she's very quite, quite content being there. But recently, we've heard she had an anti Super Bowl party to get together with girls that didn't like the Super Bowl. <laughs> she went out on Valentine's Day with another group of girls. She's connecting again with friends from college that she hadn't really talked to in a while. She's busy. She has her full time job. She does the plays with this Christian school. She and she and she she gets worn out when she's with people too much. She just joined one of the women's fellowship groups in her church. And I'm thinking, what was the change? And I walk by my wife's chair, and there's a, a book that said, The Power of a Praying Parent. Same author. I said, what you been praying? Why don't you fill me in? I'd like to join in this. <laughs> to know. And then the other morning, I had a dream, and I woke up, and I was just so excited about studying what was in my dream. Is there something... And she just started to laugh. And I said, what? Last night, I prayed that you would turn to your Bibles more quickly in the morning. Don't start playing a game on your phone. Don't go turn the TV on. Don't go do all of that. And I prayed that last night. You woke up the first words out of your mouth. I got to go study my Bible. Does God answer prayer like that? You bet he does. You bet he does. And we need to remember that. So through all the changes, don't get discouraged. Pray. Pray and see what the Lord is doing. I had no idea what she was praying that. It's so neat when you discover we need to see God's power. And, and as I think about God's power, um, make sure I want to say this in the right place. Um, God has a reason for showing us his power to bolster our faith. There are times when he doesn't show us because that's what faith is. Faith, even though you can't see anything. But he does bolster our faith by showing us things from time to time. So then in this step, hearing about Jesus, hearing Jesus call, seeing Jesus' power, and finally learning to trust Jesus for all of life. You go back to Matthew 4, and this is also in the Luke 5 passage, even though they're two separate uh, happenings. Trusting Jesus for all of life. Look at verse 22 of Matthew 4. Immediately, they left the boat and their father. This is talking about James and John and followed them earlier and said, uh, Andrew and Peter left their nets as well. Learning to say, Lord, I'm giving you all of my life. How many of you sat through invitations and said, well, I know I'm saved, so this is a, a response for dedication of my life. And then you did it again and you did it again and you did it again. That's not wrong. Uh, I think you only get saved once. But sometimes people aren't sure, so they go forward again, and that's fine. 
But when you think about dedication, I gave my whole life to the Lord at a younger age. I had no idea what I was doing because I didn't know what my life was. Regularly, I discover things about myself because I'm always changing. I suffer things about myself and I discover more things about God. And I renew my commitment to give him all of my life. And he reminds me, hey, remember that thing you gave me? You took it back recently. How's it going? <laughs> Here it is, Lord. I don't want it anymore. I want you to help me with this. So these first two points, we are going to experience changes in life. We hopefully are going to experience changes in our lives. And through all that, we need to follow Jesus. Now, the last part that I want to look at here in Matthew 4, 23 through 25, is we need to follow Jesus through life's trials, through the difficulties, through the challenges, uh, the things that don't go right. Look at the first part of verse 23. He went through all throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. Have you ever been confronted with the teaching of Christ that just blows you away? And you think, I don't know if I can believe this. I don't know if I can accept this. I don't like this message, Lord. Because the people, they had that problem. The kingdom of God is at hand. Yeah, set up. Get, depose the Romans. Let's start going back to being our own kingdom again. It wasn't Jesus' purpose. We need to regularly be confronted with God's teaching. And I was thinking, we were talking last night about school and, and our salt shakers. And, it did, you know, you grow up and you start to realize, hey, I'm learning things. And the more you learn, the more powerful you feel. The more you feel like you're in control. And even that's true of learning things about the Bible and learning about Jesus. And then you get to a doctrine that makes no sense whatsoever. And there are some people say, if I can't figure it out, I can't believe it. Believe me, if you had a God that you could figure out, you wouldn't worth bother following him. He is beyond us. He is beyond us. So we should expect to be confronted with things that we're not going to be able to figure out. So we're confronted with his teaching. That's how this begins. Jesus is teaching about the kingdom. And my pastor's group, we talk about the kingdom. Well, I have different views of what the kingdom might be, or what it is going to be, or what we talk about and we laugh. But we're all in agreement of this. The kingdom of God is wherever Jesus reigns. So whatever we believe theologically, do you believe that he reigns in you? Are you, are you submitting to him as your king? Well then, the last part of verse 23 says, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people, confronted with suffering, when was the first time you realized something bad happened to somebody you loved? When did you realize there were sicknesses? Maybe the first time you got sick. Maybe. When was that first time? And you sit there, why? Why does this have to happen? God, if you're so strong and if you're so loving, why does this have to happen? And he teaches me and says, the secret things belong to me. Trust me with the rest. Trust me with the things you don't understand. I don't like that. Uh, my reading through the Old Testament, I just read through the book of Job. Job, one of the earliest stories in creation. You, you take through the, the Noah's Ark and the flood, and sometime after that, the story of Job happened, and it was passed on for people to hear until finally um, it was written down by someone. Don't know when exactly and who, but that, that story of Job is a hard story. Confronted with suffering. And the, the, the hardest part about Job is he doesn't get an answer. At the end, God reveals himself in power, and he says, I, I've spoken what I should. I'm going to trust you. And we know there's an answer because Satan wanted the testament. God allowed it. But, but Job didn't necessarily know that. So we, we see that we're confronted with teachings that are harder. We're confronted with suffering that are, that are harder than we think we can handle but we're also confronted with his power. Look at verse 24. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. 
Think about all the things we see today and wonder what it was like back then. Confronted with his power, Jesus was able to heal them. But when you see someone who is so powerful, that causes fear, doesn't it? We need to be confronted by God's power. It's greater than anything we understand. And, and I've said this many times, but it's important. Why doesn't God just stop people from getting sick instead of letting them get sick and then healing them? Why doesn't he do it that way? He has his reasons. The thing that I would like to say, there are four, four major times in the Bible where there are a lot of miracles being done. And each time, he was verifying a messenger. He was showing that this is the messenger, listen to what he has to say. The first one was Moses. I'm now reading that in my Old Testament readings. And when God calls him from the burning bush and he says, I want to send you the people, they're not going to listen to me. Okay, throw down your staff. Turns into a snake. Moses runs away like a really manly man. And God says, come back here and pick that thing up by the tail. And he does. And then, then he says, and if they don't believe that, put your hand in your cloak. Pull it out, and he's got leprosy. And so I put it back in, pull it out, it's healed again. And, said, and if they don't believe that, take some water and pour it out before them, and it'll turn to blood. So then I, I read through the first four, uh, just this morning, I read through the first four plagues. Because Moses went to the people, and he said, okay. And of course, when he went to Pharaoh, the first thing to happen, you're not going to get any straw anymore. You're lazy. Made it harder. Got worse before it was going to get better. But then he continued on. And the whole Nile and all the water was turned to blood, the first plague. And out from that, the frogs were driven onto the land. And the frogs were all over. And they stank. And it just, it, I keep hearing it. It smelled pretty bad. Think about what's going on in Ohio right now. To see what the water has been done and so forth. After that, the gnats that were biting people and just on people everywhere. And then the fourth one, I like it. When I get to the fourth one, I like it a little bit better. Because I will separate. This won't happen to the Israelites. It's only going to happen to Egypt. That's the way you should have done it from the beginning, Lord. Why do you make your people suffer in the midst of what you're doing? Because he has a plan. So, confronted with his power, that verified who Moses was. Because he's the writer of the first five books of the Bible. Genesis through Deuteronomy, the law. I'm going to verify my messenger because of the mighty works. Now, there's history books in the Old Testament. No, no real verification. They just wrote the history down. We should verify our history books more and more these days. But um, then he starts to speak mostly through the prophets who are going to finish up the Old Testament. First two prophets, Elijah and Elisha. Read through Kings. It's a fun it's a fun book to see all the miracles that they did. Elijah did so many, and Elisha came back and did twice as many. God was saying, I'm speaking through my prophets. Now, not every prophet did miracles, but God used the miracles to say, this is an office that I want you to pay attention to. I want you to listen to the prophets. And then, of course, when Jesus came from the beginning, he did miracles to attest that he was the Son of God. And when he was asked for a sign, he said, you know, if you need this sign, I'll tell you the only sign you really need is that put me in the earth for three days, just like Jonah was in the whale, and I'll, I'll come out. And then the last is the book of Acts. The book of Acts started in the first century church. There were a lot of miracles done. Do we see those same kind of miracles today? I don't know. I know God still heals. I just don't quite believe in faith healers. Um, I know God still shares messages with people, but I don't believe that there are prophets that speak at the same level as the Word of God. We know that right now something's happening at Asbury uh, University in Kentucky. They're calling it a revival. The, the things that I've seen about it so far, I like because I believe every revival is going to start with repentance. And apparently the story is somebody got up in one of their chapel meetings and confessed his sin. And it touched everybody, and it started something. Now, I just saw something last night that said, someone went down to investigate, and they said, well, nothing's really happening right now. It usually picks up more in the evening. I don't know what I think about that. But the fact is, there's a moving of God, 
And remember, revival isn't getting people saved, it's reviving those who are saved. And then people get saved. So put that in the right So We need to know that God is powerful, but God's power is generally used to verify a message. If he's getting people's attention, he's doing it so that they would hear the message of the gospel. One more thing that we're confronted by, um, verse 25. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan, confronted with success. A lot of people in our world that have failed this test, when they start to feel really good about who they are in service to the Lord, and then they fall and they stumble. I think this may be the hardest complication. When things start going well, do you go off on your own way? Well, we're, we're doing well. It has been a blessing this year to know that we stepped out in faith and hired Pastor Matthew, and the giving came, and new faces started to come. And the ministries that we've already heard of the children, the teens that are coming, to the ministries that are already just starting, that's great. But we can't sit back and rest and say, oh, we're good now. It's a daily battle with the enemy to serve the Lord. It's a daily turning to Jesus and our own personal repentance to see what he's going to do. We need to be confronted with his teaching regularly. We need to be confronted with our hardships. We need to be confronted with his power. And so we won't get stumped. We won't stumble over success. Because what's success to one person is nothing to another person. I've been in a church of 400, I've been in this church, I've been in another church, 200, this, we're down about 130, 120 uh, right now because of COVID and other things. We were already down before COVID. It's not about the numbers, it's about the faithfulness. It's about being confronted through life's trials. Our trials show us that we need Jesus. My conclusion is this, we must accept the changes in trials as God's plan for our discipleship. How's he going to grow you? The world is ever-changing. Not going to stop that. We are called to change and grow, adapt or die, people will say. God will reveal himself in our trials. That's We should see that as part of our discipleship. As I mentioned, we're going to have a discussion now. I lied. I said it would start at 11.15 in the bulletin. I had hopes. I had hopes. But we'll get started here in a moment. The town hall, and then next week, annual meeting. And then our vision meeting. We need to be praying about those things. We need to see how the Lord is leading. We're going to close in a song. The, the uh, statements up there are going to stay there. We're going to sit down and just quietly pray. And I'm going to lead you in a little chorus before I pronounce the benediction. So song, sign up to have a prayer, and then a little chorus. Scott. I can usually pray now, but. Father, I pray that as we prepare to close the service, that we would sense your presence. Let us know that you are very much at work in us through all of life's challenges and through life's changes. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Since it's probably more important we meditate than we sing, we're going to sing one verse That's fine. Of, of hymn number 603, and then we can sit down and uh, meditate on... Pastor's conclusion. Let's stand as we as we say.
Please sing with me the last verse of I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Let's sing together. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided. And now, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming.